a preface to the reader. The author of the ensuing discourse, now with God, reaping the fruit of all his labor, diligence, and success in his master's service, did experience in himself, through the grace of God, the nature, excellency, and comfort of a truly broken and contrite spirit, so that what is here written is but a transcript out of his own heart for God, who had much work for him to do, was still hewing and hammering him by his word, and sometimes also by more than ordinary temptations and desertions. The design and also the issue thereof through God's goodness was the humbling and keeping of him low in his own eye. The truth is, as himself sometimes acknowledged, he always needed the thorn in the flesh. And God in mercy sent it him, left under his extraordinary circumstances, he should be exalted above measure, which perhaps was the evil that did more easily beset him than any other. But the Lord was pleased to overrule it, to work for his good, and to keep him in that broken frame which is so acceptable unto him, and concerning which it is said that he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalms 147 and 3. And indeed, it is a most necessary qualification that should always be found in the disciples of Christ who are most eminent, and as the stars of the first magnitude in the firmament of the church. Disciples, in the highest form of profession, need to be thus qualified in the exercise of every grace and the performance of every duty. It is that which God doth principally and more especially look after in all our approaches and accesses to him. It is to him that God will look, and with him God will dwell who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Isaiah 57, 15, 66, and 2. And the reason why God will manifest so much respect to one so qualified is because he carries it so becomingly toward him. He comes and lies at his feet and discovers a quickness of sense and apprehensiveness of whatever may be dishonorable and distasteful to God. Psalms 38 and 4. And if the Lord doth at any time but shake his rod over him, he comes trembling and kisses the rod and says, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. First Samuel 3.18 He is sensible. He hath sinned and gone astray like a lost sheep, and therefore will justify God in his severest proceedings against him. This broken heart is also a pliable and flexible heart, and prepared to receive whatsoever impressions God shall make upon it, and is ready to be molded into any frame that shall best please the Lord. He says with Samuel, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. First Samuel 3.10 And with David, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalms 27 and 8 And so with Paul, who tremblingly said, Lord, what Wilt thou have me to do? Acts 9 and 6. Now, therefore, surely such a heart as this is must needs be very delightful to God. He says to us, My son, give me thine heart. Proverbs 23, 26. But doubtless he means there a broken heart. 
an unbroken heart we may keep to ourselves. It is the broken heart which God will have us to give to him. For indeed, it is all the amends that the best of us are capable of making for all the injury we have done to God in sinning against him. We are not able to give better satisfaction for breaking God's laws than by breaking our own heart. This is all that we can do of that kind, for the blood of Christ only must give the due and full satisfaction to the justice of God for what provocations we are at any time guilty of. But all that we can do is to accompany the acknowledgement we make of miscarriages with a broken and contrite spirit. Therefore we find that when David had committed those two foul sins of adultery and murder against God, he saw that all his sacrifices signified nothing to the expiating of his guilt. Therefore he brings to God a broken heart which carried in it the best expression of indignation against himself as of the highest respect he could show to God. Second Corinthians 7 and 11. The day in which we live and the present circumstances which the people of God and these nations are under do loudly proclaim a very great necessity of being in this broken and tender frame. For who can foresee what will be the issue of these violent fermentations that are amongst us? Who knows what will become of the ark of God? Therefore it is a seasonable duty with old Eli to sit trembling for it. Do we not also hear the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of wars? And ought we not with the prophet to cry out, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, and so forth. Jeremiah 4.19 Thus was that a holy man affected with the consideration of what might befall Jerusalem, the temple and ordinances of God, and so forth, as a consequence of the present dark dispensations they were under. Will not a humble posture best become us when we have humbling providences in prospect, mercy and judgment seem to be struggling in the same womb of providence, and which will come first out we know not, but neither of them can we comfortably meet, but with a broken and a contrite spirit. If judgment comes, Josiah's posture of tenderness will be the best we can be found in. And also to say with David, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgment. Psalms 119, verse 120. It is very sad when God smites and we are not grieved, which the prophet complains of. Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved, and so forth. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Jeremiah 5, 3. But such as know the power of his anger will have a deep awe of God upon their hearts, and observing him in all his motions will have the greatest apprehension of his displeasure, so that when he is coming forth in any terrible dispensation, they will, according to their duty, prepare to meet him with a humble and broken heart. But if he should appear to us in his goodness and farther lengthen out the day of our peace and liberty, yet still the contrite frame will be most seasonable. Then will be a proper time with Job 
to abhor ourselves in dust and ashes, and to say with David, Who am I that thou hast brought me hitherto? Job 42, 6, 2 Samuel 7, 18. But we must still know that this broken, tender heart is not a plant that grows in our own soil, but is the peculiar gift of God himself. He that made the heart must break the heart. We may be under heart-breaking providences, and yet the heart remain altogether unbroken, as it was with Pharaoh, whose heart, though it was under the hammers of ten terrible judgments, immediately succeeding one another, yet continued hardened against God, the heart of man is harder than hardness itself, till God softeneth and breaks it. Men move not, they relent not. Let God thunder never so terribly. Let God in the greatest earnest cast abroad his firebrands, arrows, and death in the most dreadful representations of wrath and judgment. Yet still man trembles not, nor is any more astonished than if in all this God were but in jest, till he comes and falls to work with him and forces him to cry out, What have I done? What shall I do? Therefore, let us have recourse to him who, as he gives the new heart, so also therewith the broken heart. And let men's hearts be never so hard. If God comes once to deal effectually with them, they shall become mollified and tender, as it was with those hardened Jews who by wicked and cruel hands murdered the Lord of life. Though they stouted it out a great while, yet how suddenly, when God brought them under the hammer of his word, and spirit in Peter's powerful ministry, were they broken, and being pricked in their hearts, cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37 And the like instance we have in the jailer, who was a most barbarous, hard-hearted wretch. Yet when God came to deal with him, he was soon tamed, and his heart became exceeding soft and tender. Acts 16.29.30 Men may speak long enough, and the heart not at all be moved. But the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty, and breaketh the rocks and cedars. Psalm 29 and 4. He turns the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of water. Psalms a hundred and fourteen and eight, and this is a glorious work indeed, that hearts of stone should be dissolved and melted into waters of godly sorrow, working repentance not to be repented of. Second Corinthians seven ten. When God speaks effectually, the stoutest heart must melt and yield. Wait upon God then for the softening thy heart, and avoid whatsoever may be a means of hardening it, as the apostle cautions the Hebrews, take heed, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3.13. Sin is deceitful, and will harden all those that indulge it. The more tender any man is to his lust, the more will he be hardened by it. There is a native hardness in every man's heart, and though it may be softened by gospel means, yet if those means be afterwards neglected, the heart will fall to its native hardness again, as it is with the wax and the clay. Therefore, how much doth it behoove us to keep close to God in the use of all gospel means, whereby our hearts being once softened may be always kept so, which is best done by repeating the use of those means 
which were at first blessed for the softening of them. The following treaties may be of great use to the people of God through his blessing accompanying it to keep their hearts tender and broken when so many after their hardness and impenitent heart are treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath, Romans 2, 5. Oh, let none who peruse this book heard with that generation of hardened ones, but be a companion of all those that mourn in Zion and whose hearts are broken for their own, the churches and the nation's provocations, who indeed are the only likely ones that will stand in the gap to divert judgments. When Shishak, king of Egypt, with a great hope, came up against Judah, and having taken their frontier fence cities, they sat down before Jerusalem, which put them all under a great consternation. But the king and princesses upon this humbled themselves. The Lord sends a gracious message to them by Shemaiah the prophet. The import whereof was that because they humbled themselves, the Lord would not destroy them, nor pour out his wrath upon them by the hand of Shishak. Second Chronicles 12, 5-7 The greater the party is of mourning Christians, the more hope we have that the storm impending may be blown over, and the blessings enjoyed may yet be continued. As long as there is a sighing party, we may hope to be yet pre preserved. At least such will have the mark set upon them, which shall distinguish them from those whom the slaughtermen shall receive commission to destroy. Ezekiel 9, 4 through 6. But I shall not further enlarge the porch as designing to make way for the reader's entrance into the house, for I doubt not, but he will be pleased with the furniture and provision he finds in it. And I shall only further assure him that this whole book was not only prepared for, but also put into the press by the author himself, whom the Lord was pleased to remove, to the great loss, and unexpressible grief of many precious souls before the sheets could be all wrought off. And now, as I hinted in the beginning, that what was transcribed out of the author's heart into the book may be transcribed out of the book into the hearts of all who shall peruse it is the desire and prayer of a lover and honorer of all saints as such. September the 21st, 1688, George Cocaine. The Acceptable Sacrifice or The Excellency of a Broken Heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalms 51, 17. This psalm is David's penitential psalm. It may be fitly so called because it is a psalm by which is manifest the unfeigned sorrow which he had for his horrible sin in defiling of Bathsheba and slaying Uriah her husband, a relation at large of which you have in the eleventh and twelfth of the second of Sabbath. Many workings of heart, as this psalm showeth, this poor man had, so soon as conviction did fall upon his spirit. One, while he cries for mercy, then he confesses his heinous offenses. Then he bewails the depravity of his nature, 
Sometimes he cries out to be washed and sanctified. And then again, he is afraid that God will cast him away from his presence and take his Holy Spirit utterly from him. And thus he goes on till he comes to the text. And there he stayeth his mind, finding in himself that heart and spirit which God did not dislike. The sacrifices of God, says he, are a broken spirit, as if he should say, I thank God I have that. A broken and a contrite heart, says he, O God, thou wilt not despise, as if he should say, I thank God I have that. One, the text opened in the many workings of the heart. The words consist of two parts. First, an assertion. Second, a demonstration of that assertion. The assertion is this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The demonstration is this. Because a broken and a contrite heart, God will not despise. In the assertion, we have two things present themselves to our consideration. First, that a broken spirit is to God a sacrifice. Second, that it is to God as that which answereth to or goeth beyond all sacrifices. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The demonstration of this is plain. For that heart, God will not despise it. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Whence I draw this conclusion, that a spirit rightly broken, a heart truly contrite, is to God an excellent thing, that is, a thing that goes beyond all external duties whatever. For that is intended by this saying, the sacrifices, because it answereth to all sacrifices which we can offer to God. Yea, it serveth in the room of all. All our sacrifices without this are nothing. This alone is all. There are four things that are very acceptable to God. The first is the sacrifice of the body of Christ for our sins. Of this you read Hebrews 10, for there you have it, preferred to all burnt offerings and sacrifices. It is this that pleaseth God. It is this that sanctifieth and so setteth the people acceptable in the sight of God. Second, Unfeigned love to God is counted better than all sacrifices or external parts of worship. And to love him, the Lord thy God, with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Mark 12.33 Third, to walk holily and humbly and obediently towards and before God is another. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Micah 6, 6 through 8, 1 Samuel 15.22 Fourth, and this in our text is the fourth. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. But note, by the way, that this broken, this broken and contrite heart is thus excellent only to God. O God, saith he, Thou wilt not despise it. By which is implied, the world have not this esteem 
or respect for such a heart, or for one that is of a broken and contrite spirit. No, no, a man, a woman that is blessed with a broken heart is so far off from getting by that esteem with the world that they are but burdens and trouble houses wherever they are or go. Such people carry with them molestation and disquietment. They are in carnal families as David was to the king of Gath, troublers of the house, 1 Samuel 21. Their sighs, their tears, their day and night groan, their cries and prayers and solitary carriages put all the carnal family out of order. Footnote. This is beautifully and most impressively described in the Pilgrim's Progress when the bitter feelings of poor Christian under convictions of sin alarm his family and put it quite out of order. Hence you have them browbeaten by some, condemned by others, yea, and their company fled from and deserted by others. But mark the text. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise, but rather accept. For not to despise is with God to esteem and set a high price upon. Who? The doctrine, assertion, demonstration, and conclusion that a broken and truly contrite heart is an excellent heart but we will demonstrate by several particulars that a broken spirit, a spirit rightly broken, and heart truly contrite, is to God an excellent thing. First, this is evident from the comparison. Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and so forth. Mark. He rejected sacrifices, offerings, and sacrifices. That is, all Levitical ceremonies under the law and all external performances under the gospel, but accepteth a broken heart. It is therefore manifest by this, were there nothing else to be said, that proves that a heart rightly broken a heart truly contrite is to God an excellent thing. For as you see, such a heart is set before all sacrifice. And yet they were the ordinances of God and things that he commanded. But lo, a broken spirit is above them all. A contrite heart goes beyond them, yea, beyond them when put all together. Thou wilt not have the one, thou wilt not despise the other. O oh, brethren, a broken and a contrite heart is an excellent thing. Have I said a broken heart, a broken and a contrite heart is esteemed above all sacrifices? I will add. Second, it is of greater esteem with God than is either heaven or earth. And that is more than to be set before external duties. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made. And all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Mark. God saith, He hath made all these things. But he doth not say that he will look to them. That is, take complacency and delight in them. No, there is that wanting 
in all that he hath made, that should take up and delight his heart. But now let a broken-hearted sinner come before him, yea, he ranges the world throughout to find out such an one, and having found him, to this man saith he, Will I look? I say again, that such a man to him is of more value than is either heaven or earth. They say if he shall wax old, they shall perish and vanish away. But this man, he continues. He, as is presented to us in another place, under another character, he shall abide forever. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, 1 John 2, 17. To this man will I look. With this man will I be delighted. For so to look doth sometimes signify, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse, saith Christ to his humble-hearted, Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. Psalms 4 and 9 While it is as a conduit to let the rivers out of thy broken heart, I am taken, saith he, with one chain of thy neck. Psalms 4 and 9 Here you see he looks and is ravished. He looks and is taken, as it saith in another place. The king is held in the galleries, that is, is taken with his beloved, with the dove's eyes of his beloved, with the contrite spirit of his people. Psalms 7, 5, Psalms 1, 15. But it is not thus reported of him with respect to heaven or earth, them, he sets more lightly by. Them he reserves unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Second Peter 3 and 7. But the broken in heart are his beloved, his jewel. Wherefore, what I have said as to this must go for the truth of God, to wit, that a broken hearted sinner a sinner with a contrite spirit is of more esteem with God than is either heaven or earth. He saith he hath made them, but he doth not say he will look to them. He is saith they are his throne and footstool, but he doth not say they have taken or ravished his heart. No, it is those that are of a contrite spirit do this, but there is yet more in the words, to this man will I look, that is, for this man will I care, about this man will I camp, I will put this man under my protection, for so to look to one doth sometimes signify, and I take the meaning in this place to be such, Proverbs 27, 23, Jeremiah 39, 12, Jeremiah 40 and 4. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Psalms 145, 14. And the brokenhearted are of this number, wherefore he careth for, campeth about, and hath set his eyes upon such an one for good. This, therefore, is a second demonstration to prove that the man that hath his spirit rightly broken, his heart truly contrite, is of great esteem with God. Third, yet further, God doth not only prefer such an one, as has been said before heaven and earth, but he loveth. He desireth to have that man for an enemy, for a companion. He must dwell. He must cohabit with him that is of a broken heart, with such as are of a contrite spirit. 
For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit and so forth. Isaiah 57, 15. Behold here both the majesty and condescension of the high and lofty one. His majesty, in that he is high, and the inhabitor of eternity. I am the high and lofty one, saith he, I inhabit eternity. Verily this consideration is enough to make the broken-hearted man creep into a mouse hole to hide himself from such a majesty. But behold his heart, his condescending mind, I am for dwelling also with him that hath a broken heart, with him that is of a contrite spirit. That is the man that I would converse with. That is the man with whom I will cohabit. That is he, saith God, I will choose for my companion. For to desire to dwell with one supposes all these things, and verily of all the men in the world, None have acquaintance with God, none understand, but communion with him and what his teachings mean. But such as are of a broken and contrite heart, he is nigh unto them that are of a broken spirit. Psalms 34, 18. These are they intended in the 14th Psalm, where it is said, The Lord looked down from heaven to see if any did understand and seek God, that he might find somebody in the world with whom he might converse. For indeed, there is none else that either understand or that can tend to hearken to him. God, as I may say, is forced to break men's heart before he can make them willing to cry to him or be willing that he should have any concerns with them. The rest shut their eyes, stop their ears, withdraw their hearts, or say unto God, Be gone, Job 21:14. But now the broken in heart can tend it. He has leisure, yea, leisure and will and understanding and all, and therefore is a fit man to have to do with God. There is room also in this man's house, in this man's heart, in this man's spirit, for God to dwell, for God to walk, for God to set up a kingdom. Here, therefore, is suitableness. Can two walk together, saith God, except they be agreed? Amos 3 and 3. The brokenhearted desireth God's company. When wilt thou come unto me, said he, the brokenhearted loveth to hear God speak and talk to him. Here is a suitableness. Make me, said he, to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Psalm 51.8 but here lies the glory in that the high and lofty one, the God that inhabiteth eternity, and that was a high and holy place for his habitation, should choose to dwell with and to be a companion of the broken in heart and of them that are of, are of a contrite spirit. Here and here also is great comfort for such. For God doth not only prefer such a heart before all sacrifices, nor esteems such a man above heaven and earth, nor yet only desire to be of his acquaintance, but he reserveth for him his chief comforts, his heart reviving, and soul cherishing cordials. I dwell, saith he, with such to revive them, and to support and comfort them, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. 
Isaiah 57, 50. The broken-hearted man is a fainting man. He has his qualms, his sinking fits. He oftentimes dies away with pain and fear. He must be stayed with flagons and comforted with apples, or else he cannot tell what to do. He finds. He finds a way in his iniquity, nor can anything keep him alive and make it well but the comforts and cordials of Almighty God. Exodus 33, 10 and 11. Wherefore with such an one God will dwell to revive the heart, to revive the spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God has cordials, but they are to comfort them that are cast down, Second Corinthians 7, 6. And such are the brokenhearted. As for them that are whole, they need not the position, Mark 2, 17. They are the broken in spirit that stand in need of cordials. Physicians are men of no esteem but with them that feel their sickness. And this is one reason why God is so little accounted of in the world, even because they have not been made sick by the wounding stroke of God. But now, when a man is wounded, has his bones broken, or is made sick and laid at the grave's mouth, who is of that esteem with him? as is an able physician. What is so much desired, as are the cordial comforts and suitable supplies of the skillful physician in those matters? And thus it is with the brokenhearted. He needs, and God has prepared for him, plenty of the comforts and cordials of heaven to succor and relieve his sinking soul. Wherefore, such a one lieth under all the promises that have succor in them, and consolation for men sick and desponding under the sense of sin, and the heavy wrath of God, and they, says God, shall be refreshed and revived with them. Yea, they are designed for them. He hath therefore broken their hearts. He hath therefore wounded their spirit, that he might make them apt to relish his reviving cordials, that he might minister to them his reviving comforts. For indeed, so soon as he hath broken them, his bowels yearn, and his compassions roll up and down within him, and will not suffer him to abide afflicting. Ephraim was one of these. But so soon as God had smitten him, behold his heart, how it works towards him. Is Ephraim, saith he, my dear son, that is, he is so. Is he a pleasant child, that is, he is so. For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 18 through 20. This, therefore, is another demonstration. Fifth, as God prefers such a heart and esteems the man that has it above heaven and earth, as he covets intimacy with such a one and prepares for him his cordials, so when he sent his son Jesus into the world to be a savior, he gave him in special a charge to take care of such. Yea, that was one of the main reasons he sent him down from heaven, anointed for his work on earth. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, said he, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, and so forth. Luke 4.18, Isaiah 61.1 1. Now, that this is meant of Christ is confirmed by his own lips, for in the days of his flesh he takes this book 
in his hand when he was in the synagogue at Nazareth and read this very place unto the people and then tells them that that very day that scripture was fulfilled in their ears. Luke 6, 16 through 18. But see, these are the souls whose welfare is contrived in the heavens. God consulted their salvation, their deliverance, their health, before his son came down from thence. Doth not therefore this demonstrate that a broken-hearted man, that a man of a contrite spirit, is of great esteem with God? I have often wondered at David that he should give Joab and the men of war a charge that they take heed, that they carry it tenderly to that young rebel Absalom his son, Second Samuel 18 and 5. But that God, the high God, the God against whom we have sinned, should so soon as he has smitten, give his son a command, a charge, a commission, to take care of to bind up and heal the broken in heart. This is that which can never be sufficiently admired or wondered at by men or angels. And as this was his commission, so he acted as is evidently set forth by the parable of the man who fell among thieves. He went to him, poured into his wounds wine and oil. He bound him up, took him, set him upon his own beast, had him to an inn, gave the host a charge to look well to him with money in hand, and a promise at his return to recompense him in what further he should be expensive while he was under his care. Luke 10, 30-35 Behold, therefore, the care of God which he has for the broken in heart, he has given a charge to Christ his Son to look well to them and to bind up and heal their wounds. Behold also the faithfulness of Christ, who doth not hide but read this commission as soon as he entereth upon his ministry, and also falls into the practical part thereof. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalms 147, 3. And behold again, into whose care a broken heart and a contrite spirit hath put this poor creature. He is under the care of God, the care and cure of Christ. If a man was sure that his disease had put him under the special care of the king and the queen, Yet could he not be sure of life, he might die under their sovereign hands, eh? But here is a man in the favor of God, and under the hand of Christ to be healed, under whose hand none yet ever died for want of skill and power in him to save their life. Wherefore this man must live. Christ has in commission not only to bind up his wounds, but to heal him. He has of himself so expounded it in reading his commission. Wherefore, he that has his heart broken and that is of a contrite spirit must not only be taken in hand, but healed. Healed of his pain, grief, sorrow, sin, and fears of death and hell fire. Wherefore, he adds, that he must give unto such beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and must comfort all that mourn. Isaiah 61, 2 and 3. This I say, he has in the commission, the brokenhearted are put into his hand, and he has said himself, he will heal him. Hence he says of that same man, I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners, and I will heal him. Isaiah 57, 18, 19, 
And this is a fifth demonstration. Six. As God prefers such a heart, and so esteems the man that has it, as he desires his company, has provided for him his cordials, and given a charge to Christ to heal him, so he has promised in conclusion to save him. He saveth such as be of a contrite spirit, or as the margin has it, that be contrite of spirit. Psalms 34, 18. And this is the conclusion of all. For to save a man is the end of all special mercy. He saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. To save is to forgive. For without forgiveness of sins we cannot be saved. To save is to preserve one in this miserable world and to deliver one from all those devils, temptations, snares, and destructions that would, were we not kept, were we not preserved of God, destroy us body and soul forever. To save is to bring a man body and soul to glory and to give him an eternal mansion house in heaven that he may dwell in the presence of this good God and the Lord Jesus and to sing to them the songs of his redemption forever and ever. This it is to be saved, nor can anything less than this complete the salvation of the sinner. Now this is to be the lot of him that is of a broken heart and the end that God will make with him that is of a contrite spirit. He saveth such as be contrite of spirit. He saveth such. This is excellent. But do the broken in spirit believe this? Can they imagine that this is to be the end that God has designed them to? And that he intended to make with them in the day in which he began to break their hearts? No, no, they, alas, think quite the contrary. They are afraid that this is but the beginning of death, and a token that they shall never see the face of God with comfort, either in this world or that which is to come. Hence they cry, Cast me not away from thy presence, or now I am free among the dead, whom God remembers no more. Psalms 51 and 11, Psalms 88, 4 and 5. For indeed, there goes to the breaking of the heart a visible appearance of the wrath of God and a home charge from heaven of the guilt of sin to the conscience. This to reason is very dreadful, for it cuts the soul down to the ground, for a wounded spirit who none can bear. Proverb 18.14 It seems also now to this man that this is but the beginning of hell, but as it were the first step down to the pit, when indeed all these are but the beginnings of love, and but that which makes way for life. The Lord kills before he makes alive. He wounds before his hands make hold. Yea, he does the one in order to, or because he would do the other. He wounds because his purpose is to heal. He maketh sore and bindeth up. He wounded, and his hands make hold. Deuteronomy 32, 39, 1 Samuel 2, 6, Job 5, 18. His design, I say, is the salvation of the soul. He scourges, he breaketh the heart of every son whom he receiveth, and woe be to him whose heart God breaketh not. And thus have I proved what at first I asserted, namely, that a spirit rightly broken and heart truly contrite is to God an excellent thing, a broken and a contrite heart 
O God, thou wilt not despise. For this say I first, this is evident, for that it is better than sacrifices, than all sacrifice. Second, the man that has it is of more esteem with God than heaven or earth. Third, God coveted such a man for his intimate and house companion. Fourth, he reserveth for them his cordials and spiritual comfort. Fifth, he has given his son a charge, a commandment to take care that the brokenhearted be healed, and he is resolved to heal it. Sixth, and concluded that the brokenhearted and they that are of a contrite spirit shall be saved, that is, possessed of the heaven. Three, what a broken heart and what a contrite spirit is. I come now in order to show you what a broken heart and what a contrite spirit is. This must be done because in the discovery of this lies both the comfort of them that have it and the conviction of them that have it not. Now that I may do this the better, I must propound and speak to these four things. First, I must show you what and one that heart is that is not broken, that is not contrite. Second, I must show you how or with what the heart is broken and made contrite. Third, show you how and what it is when broken and made contrite. And fourth, I shall last of all give you some signs of a broken and contrite heart. First, for the first of these to wit, one and one that heart is that is not a broken, that is, not a contrite heart. First, the heart, before it is broken, is hard and stubborn and obstinate against God and the salvation of the soul. Zechariah 7.12 Deuteronomy 2.30, Deuteronomy 9.27. Second, it is a heart full of evil imaginations and darkness. Genesis 18 and 12, Romans 1.21. Third, it is a heart deceitful and subject to be deceived, especially about the things of an eternal concernment. Isaiah 44.20, Deuteronomy 11.16. Fourth, it is a heart that rather gathers iniquity and vanity to itself than anything that is good for the soul. Psalms 41 and 6, Psalms 94 and 11. Fifth, it is an unbelieving heart and one that will turn away from God to sin. Hebrews 3.12, Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. Six, it is a heart not prepared for God being uncircumcised, nor for the reception of his holy word. Second Chronicles twelve fourteen, Psalms seventy eight eight, Acts seven fifty one. Seventh, it is a heart not single, but double. It will pretend to serve God, but will withal lean toward the devil and sin. Psalms twelve and two. Ezekiel Thirty-three, thirty-one. Eight. It is a heart proud and stout. It loves not to be controlled, though the controller be God Himself. Psalms one hundred one five, Proverbs sixteen five, Malachi three thirteen. Ninth. It is a heart that will give place to Satan, but will resist the Holy Ghost. Acts 5.3, Acts 7.51. Ten, in a word, it is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, so wicked that none can know it, Jeremiah 17.9, that the heart before it is broken is such 
and worse than I have described it to be, is sufficiently seen by the whole course of the world. Where is the man whose heart has not been broken, and whose spirit is not contrite, that according to the word of God deals honestly with his own soul? It is one character of a right heart, that it is sound in God's statutes and honest. Psalm 119, 18, Luke 8, 15. Now an honest heart will not put off itself, nor be put off with that which will not go for current money with the merchants. I mean with that which will not go for saving grace at the day of judgment. But alas, alas, but few men, how honest soever they are to others, have honesty towards themselves, though he is the worst of deceivers, who deceiveth his own soul, as James has it, about the things of his own soul. James 1, 22, 26. But, second, I now come to show you with what and how the heart is broken and the spirit made contrite. First, with what the heart is broken, and the spirit made contrite. The instrument with which the heart is broken, and with which the spirit is made contrite, is the word. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? Jeremiah 23:29. The rock, in this text is the heart, which in another place is compared to an adamant, which adamant is harder than flint. Zechariah 7, 11, 12, Ezekiel 3, 9. This rock, this adamant, this stony heart is broken and made contrite by the word. But it only is so when the word is as a fire and as a hammer to break and melt it, and then and then only, is is as a fire and a hammer to the heart to break it when it is managed by the arm of God. No man can break the heart with the word. No angel can break the heart with the word. That is, if God forbears to second it by mighty power from heaven, this made Balaam go without it, a heart rightly broken and truly contrite, though he was rebuked by an angel, and the Pharisees die in their sins, though rebuked for them, and admonished to turn from them by the Savior of the world. Wherefore, though the word is the instrument with which the heart is broken, yet it is not broken with the word so that word is managed by the might and power of God. This made the prophet Isaiah, after long preaching, cry out that he had labored for naught and in vain. And this made him cry to God to rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains or rocky hills or hearts might be broken and melt at his presence. Isaiah 49, 4. Isaiah 64, 1 and 2. For he found by experience that as to this no effectual work could be done unless the Lord put to his hand. This also is often intimated in the scriptures where it saith, When the preachers preached effectually to the breaking of men's hearts, the Lord wrought with them. The hand of the Lord was with them, and the like. Mark 16.20, Acts 11.21. Now when the hand of the Lord is with the word, then it is mighty. It is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10.4. It is sharp. Then as a sword in the soul and spirit, it sticks like an arrow in the hearts of sinners to the causing of the people to fall at his foot for mercy. Hebrews 4.12. Then it is as was said afore, as a fire and as a hammer to break this rock in pieces. 
Psalms 110 and 3. And hence the word is made mention of under a double consideration. One, as it stands by itself. Two, as attended with power from heaven. One, as it stands by itself and is not seconded with saving operation from heaven. It is called the word only, the word fairly, or as if it was only the word of men. First Thessalonians 1, 5 through 7, 1 Corinthians 4, 19, 20, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Because then it is only as managed by men who are not able to make it accomplish that work. The word of God, when in a man's hand only, is like the father's sword in the hand of the suckling child, which sword, though never so well pointed, and though never so sharp on the edges, is not now able to conquer a foe, to make an enemy fall, and cry out for mercy, because it is but in the hand of the child. But now let the same sword be put into the hand of a skillful father, and God is both skillful and able to manage his word, and then the sinner and then the proud helpers too are both made to stoop and submit themselves. Wherefore I say, though the word be the instrument yet of itself doth do no saving good to the soul. The heart is not broken, nor the spirit made contrite thereby. It only worketh death, and leaveth men in the chains of their sins still faster bound over to eternal condemnation. Second Corinthians 2, 15, 16. Two but when seconded by mighty power, then the same word is as the roaring of a lion, as the piercing of a sword, as a burning fire in the bones, as thunder, and as a hammer that dashes all to pieces. Jeremiah 25.30, Amos 1.2, Amos 3.8, Acts 2.37, Jeremiah 20.9, Psalms 29, 3 to 9. Wherefore, from hence it is to be concluded that whoever has heard the word preached and has not heard the voice of the living God therein has not as yet had their hearts broken nor their spirits made contrite for their sins. Second, how the heart is broken and the spirit made contrite. And this leads me to the second thing, to wit, to show how the heart is broken, and the spirit made contrite by the word. And verily, it is when the word comes home with power. But yet this is but general. Wherefore, more particularly, one, then the word works effectually to this purpose when it findeth out the sinner and his sin, and shall convince him that it has found him out, thus it was with our first father. When he had sinned, he sought to hide himself from God. He gets among the trees of the garden, and there he shrouds himself. But yet not thinking himself secure, he covers himself with fig leaves, and now he lieth quiet. Now God shall not find me, thinks he, nor know what I have done. But lo, by and by he hears the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. And now, Adam, what do you mean to do? Why, as yet he skulketh and hides his head and seeks yet to lie undiscovered. But behold, the voice cries out, Adam, and now he begins to tremble. Adam, where art thou, says God? And now Adam is made to answer. Genesis 3, 7 through 11. 
But the voice of the Lord God doth not leave him here. No, it now begins to search and to inquire after his doings and to unravel what he had wrapped together and covered until it made him bare and naked in his own sight before the face of God. Thus, therefore, doth the word when managed by the arm of God, it findeth out, it singleth out the sinner. The sinner finds it so, it finds out the sins of the sinner. It unravels his whole life. It strips him and lays him naked in his own sight before the face of God. Neither can the sinner nor his wickedness be longer hid and covered. And now begins the sinner to see what he never saw before. Who? Another instance for this is David, the man of our text. He sins. He sins grossly. He sins and hides it. Yea, and seeks to hide it from the face of God and man. Well, Nathan is sent to preach a preaching to him, and that in common, and that in special, in common by a parable, in special by a particular application of it to him. While Nathan only preached in common, or in general, David was fisho, and stood as right in his own eyes as if he had been as innocent and as harmless as any man alive. There's a footnote here about this fish hole. Fish hole is a very striking and expressive term, highly illustrative of the feelings and position of David when he was accosted by the prophet. The word hole is from the Saxon, which language abounded in Bunyan's native country of Bedford, first introduced by an ancient colony of Saxons who had settled there. It means hale, hearty, free from disease, as a fish is happy in its native element. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, Luke. 5.31. David had no spitings of conscience for his cruelty and enormous guilt. He was like a fish hole in the full enjoyment of every providential blessing, while spiritually he was dead in sin. God loved and pitied him and sent a cunning angler, Nathan the prophet, threw in the bait, which David eagerly seized, the hook entered his conscience, and he became as a fish wounded and nigh unto death. Editor George Offer But God had a love for David, and therefore commands his servant Nathan to go home, not only to David's ears, but to David's conscience. Well, David, now must fall, says Nathan. Thou art the man, says David. I have sinned. And then his heart was broken, and his spirit made contrite, as this psalm and our text the show. Second Samuel 12, 1 through 13. Three, a third instance is that of Saul. He had heard many a sermon and was become a great professor. Yea, he was more zealous than were many of his equals. But his heart was never broken, nor his spirit ever made contrite, till he heard one preach from heaven, till he heard God, in the word of God, making inquiry after his sins. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me, says Jesus, and then he can stand no longer, for then his heart break, then he falls to the ground, then he trembles, then he cries out, Who art thou, Lord? And, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Acts 9. 
Wherefore, as I said, then the word works effectually to this purpose, when it findeth out the sinner and his sin, and also when it shall convince him that it has found him out. Only I must join here a caution, for every operation of the word upon the conscience is not saving, nor doth all conviction end in the saving conversion of the sinner. It is then only such an operation of the word that is intended, namely, that shows the sinner not only the evil of his ways, but brings the heart unfeignedly over to God by Christ, and this brings me to the third thing. Third, I am therefore come to show you how and what the heart is when broken and made contrite, and this I must do by opening unto you the two chief expressions in the text. First, what is meant by this word broken? Second, what is meant by this word contrite? First, for this word broken, Tyndale renders it a troubled heart. But I think there is more in it. Footnote. The words of Tyndale are, The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God shalt thou not despise. The same Hebrew word, and I can't pronounce it, occurs in the original, both as to the spirit and the heart. Bunyan is quite right in preferring our authorized version of this verse. Coverdale, Tyndale, Taverner, and Cranmer all agree. The Genevan uses a contrite spirit, and the bishops a mortified spirit. Editor George Offer. I take it, therefore, to be a heart disabled as to former actions, even as a man whose bones are broken is disabled, as to his way of running, leaping, wrestling, or aught else, which vainly he was wont to do. Wherefore, that which was called a broken heart in the text, he calls his broken bones in verse the eighth. Cause me, saith he, to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice, Psalm 51 and 8. And why? is the breaking of the heart compared to the breaking of the bones. But because, as when the bones are broken, the outward man is disabled as to what it was wont to do. So when the spirit is broken, the inward man is disabled as to what vanity and folly it before delighted in. Hence, feebleness is joined with this Brokenness of heart. I am feeble, saith he, and sore broken. Psalms 38 and 8. I have lost my strength and former vigor as to vain and sinful courses. This then, it is to have the heart broken, namely, to have it lamed, disabled, and taken off by sense of God's wrath due to sin from the course of life it formerly was conversant in, and to show that this work is no fancy, nor done but with great trouble to the soul. It is compared to the putting the bones out of joint, the breaking of the bones, the burning of the bones with fire, or as the taking the natural moisture from the bones, the vexing of the bones, and so forth. Psalms 23, 14, Jeremiah 20 and 9, Lamentations 1, 13, Psalms 6 and 2, Proverbs 17 
and 22, all which are expressions adorned with such similitudes as do undeniably declare that to sense and feeling a broken heart is a grievous thing. Second, what is meant by the word contrite? A contrite spirit is a penitent one, one sorely grieved and deeply sorrowful for the sins it has committed against God and to the damage of the soul. And so it is to be taken in all those places where a contrite spirit is made mention of, as in Psalms 34, 18, Isaiah 57, 15, Isaiah 66, 2. As a man that has by his folly procured a broken leg or arm is heartily sorry that ever he was so foolish as to be engaged in such foolish ways of idleness and vanity. So he whose heart is broken with a sense of God's wrath due to his sin hath deep sorrow in his soul and is greatly repentant that ever he should be such a fool as by rebellious doings to bring himself and his soul to so much sharp affliction. Hence, while others are sporting themselves in vanity, such a one doth call his sin his greatest folly. My wounds stink and are corrupt, saith David, because of my foolishness. And again, O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Psalms 38, 5, Psalms 69 and 5. Men, whatever they say with their lips, cannot conclude, if yet their hearts want breaking, that sin is a foolish thing. Hence it says, the foolishness of fools is folly. Proverbs 14.24 That is, the foolishness of some men is that they take pleasure in their sins, for their sins are their foolishness, and the folly of their soul lies in their countenancing of this foolishness. But the man whose heart is broken, he is none of these. He cannot be one of these, no more than he that has his bones broken can rejoice that he is desired to play a match at football. Hence to hear others talk foolishly is to the grief of those whom God has wounded, or as it is in another place, their words are like the piercing of a sword. Psalm 69, 26, Proverbs 12, 18. This, therefore, I take to be the meaning of these two words, a broken and a contrite spirit. Fourth, lastly, as to this, I now come more particularly to give you some signs of a broken heart, of a broken and a contrite spirit. First, a broken-hearted man, such as is intended in the text, is a sensible man. He is brought to the exercise of all the senses of his soul. All others are dead, senseless, and without true feeling of what the broken-hearted man is sensible of. One he sees himself to be what others are ignorant of. That is, he sees himself to be not only a sinful man, but a man by nature in the gall and bond of sin. In the gall of sin, it is Peter's expression to Simon, and it is a saying common to all men, for every man 
in a state of nature is in the gall of sin. He was shapen in it, conceived in it. It has also possession of, and by that possession infected the whole of his soul and body. Psalms 51, 5, Acts 8, 23. This he sees, this he understands. Every professor sees not this, because the blessing of a broken heart is not bestowed on everyone. David says, There is no soundness in my flesh, and Solomon suggests that a plague or running sore is in the very heart. But everyone perceives not this. Psalms 38, 3, 1 Kings 8, 38. He saith again that his wounds stank and were corrupted, that his sore ran and ceased not. Psalms 38, 5, Psalms 77 and 2. But these things, the brutish man, the man whose heart was never broken, has no understanding of. But the brokenhearted, the man that has a broken spirit, he sees, as the prophet has it, he sees his sickness, he sees his wound. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, he sees it to his grief, he sees it to his sorrow. Hosea 5.13 Two, he feels what others have no sense of. He feels the arrows of the Almighty, and that they stick fast in him. Psalms 38.2 He feels how sore and sick by the smiting of God's hammer upon his heart to break it. His poor soul is me. He feels a burden intolerably lying upon his spirit. Hosea 5.13 Mine iniquities, saith he, are gone over mine head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Psalms 38.4 He feels also the heavy hand of God upon his soul, a thing unknown to carnal men. He feels pain, being wounded, even such pain as others cannot understand, because they are not broken. My heart, saith David, is sore pain within me. Why so? Why? The terrors of death are fallen upon me. Psalms 55, 4. The terrors of death cause pain, yea, pain of the highest nature. Hence that which is here called pain is in another place called pangs. Isaiah 21, 3. You know broken bones occasion pain, strong pain, yea, pain that will make a man or woman groan with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. Ezekiel 30 and 24. Soul pain is the sorest pain, in comparison to which the pain of the body is a very tolerable thing. Proverbs 18, 14. Now here is soul pain. Here is heart pain. Here we are discoursing of a wounded, of a broken spirit. Wherefore, this is pain to be felt to the sinking of the whole man. Neither can any support this but God. Here is death in this pain, death forever, without God's special mercy. This pain will bring the soul to, and this the broken-hearted man doth feel. The sorrows of death, saith David, compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Psalms 116.3 A. I'll warrant thee, poor man, 
Thou foundest trouble and sorrow indeed, for the pains of hell and sorrows of death are pains and sorrow the most intolerable. But this the man is acquainted with that has his heart broken. Footnote. No one could speak more feelingly upon this subject than our author. He had been in deep waters, in soul-harrowing fear, while his heart, hard by nature, was under the hammer of the word. My soul was like a broken vessel. Oh, the unthought of imaginations, frights, fears, and terrors that are affected by a thorough application of guilt yielded to desperation, like the man that had his dwelling among the tombs. Grace abounding, number 186, volume 1, page 29, editor George Offer. Whereas he sees and feels, so he hears that which augments his woe and sorrow. You know, if a man has his bones broken, he does not only see and feel, but oft times also hears what increases his grief, as that his wounds are incurable, that his bone is not rightly set, that there is danger of a gangrene, that he may be lost for want of looking to. These are the voices, the sayings that haunt the house of one that has his bones broken. And a broken-hearted man knows what I mean by this. He hears that which makes his lips quiver, and at the noise of which he seems to feel rottenness enter into his bones. He trembleth in himself and wishes that he may hear joy and gladness, that the bones, the heart, and spirit which God has broken may rejoice. Habakkuk 3.16, Psalms 51 and 8. He thinks he hears God say, the devil say, his conscience say, and all good men to whisper among themselves saying, there is no help for him from God. Job heard this, David heard this, Heman heard this, and this is the common sound in the ears of the broken-hearted. For the broken-hearted smell what others cannot scent. Alas, sin never smells so to any man alive as it smells to the broken-hearted. You know wounds will stink, but there is no stink like that of sin to the broken-hearted man. His own sins stink, and so doth the sins of all the world to him. Sin is like carrion. It is of a stinking nature. Yea, it has the worst of smells. However, some men like it. Psalms 38, 5. But none are offended with the scent thereof, but God and the broken-hearted sinner. My wounds stink and are corrupt, saith he, both in God's nostrils and mine own. But alas, who smells the stink of sin? None of the carnal world. They, like carrion, crows, seek it, love it, and eat it as the child eats bread. They eat up the sin of my people, saith God, and they set their heart on their iniquity. Hosea 4, 8. This I say they do because they do not smell the nauseous scent of sin. You know that what is nauseous to the smell cannot be palatable to the taste. The broken-hearted man doth find that sin is not his, and therefore cries out it stinketh. They also think at times the smell of fire, of fire, and brimstone is upon them, 
they are so sensible of the wages due to sin. Five, the brokenhearted is also a tasting man. Wounds, if sore and full of pains, of great pains do sometimes alter the taste of a man. They make him think his meat, his drink, yea, that cordials have a bitter taste in them. How many times doth the poor people of God, that are the only men that know what a broken heart doth mean, cry out that gravel, wormwood, gall, and vinegar was made their meat, Lamentations 3, 15, 16, 19. This gravel, gall, and wormwood is the true temporal taste of sin. And God, to make them loathe it forever, doth feed them with it till their hearts both ache and break therewith. Wickedness is pleasant of taste to the world. Hence it is said, they feed on ashes. They feed on the wind. Isaiah 44, 20, Hosea 12, and 1. Lust, or anything that is vile and refuse, the carnal world think, relishes well, as is set out most notably in the parable of the prodigal son. He would fain have filled his belly, saith our Lord, with the husk that the swine did eat, Luke fifteen sixteen. But the broken-hearted man has a relish that is true as to these things, though by reason of the anguish of his soul it abhors all manner of dainty meat, Job thirty three nineteen twenty. Psalm one hundred and seven. 17 through 19. Thus I have showed you one sign of a broken-hearted man. He is a sensible man. He has all the senses of his soul awakened. He can see, hear, feel, taste, smell, and that as none but himself can do. I come now to another sign of a broken and contrite man. Second, and that is, he is a very sorrowful man. This, as the other, is natural. It is natural to one that is in pain, and that has his bones broken, to be a grieved and sorrowful man. He is none of the jolly ones of the times, nor can he, for his bones, his heart, his heart is broken. One, he is sorry for that he feels and finds in himself a gravity of peace. I told you before, he is sensible of it. He sees it. He feels it. And here I say he is sorry for it. It is this that makes him call himself a wretched man. It is this that makes him loathe and abhor himself. It is this that makes him blush, blush before God, and be ashamed. Romans 7, 24, Job 42 and 5, 6, Ezekiel 36, 31. He finds by nature no form nor comeliness in himself, but the more he looks in the glass of the word, the more unhandsome. The more deformed he perceiveth sin has made him. Everybody sees not this, therefore everybody is not sorry for it. But the broken in heart sees that he is by sin corrupted, marred, full of lewdness and naughtiness. He sees that in him, that is in his flesh, dwells no good thing. And this makes him sorry, yea, it makes him sorry at heart. A man that has his bones broken finds he is spoiled, marred, disabled from doing as he would and should, at which he is grieved and made sorry. Many are sorry for actual transgressions, 
because they do oft bring them to shame before men. But few are sorry for the defects that sin has made in nature, because they see not those defects themselves. A man cannot be sorry for the sinful defects of nature till he sees they have rendered him contemptible to God, nor is it anything but a sight of God that can make him truly see what he is, and so be heartily sorry for being so. Now mine eye seeth thee, saith Job, now I abhor myself. Woe is me, for I am undone, saith the prophet, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord. And it was this that made Daniel say his comeliness was turned in him into corruption, for he had now the vision of the Holy One. Job 42, 6, Isaiah 6, 1 through 5, Daniel 10, 8. Visions of God break the heart, because by the sight the soul then has of his perfection it sees its own infinite and unspeakable disproportion because of the vileness of its nature. Suppose a company of ugly, uncomely, deformed persons dwelt together in one house, and suppose that they never yet saw any man or woman more than themselves, or that were arrayed with the splendors and perfections of nature, these would not be capable of comparing themselves with any but themselves, and consequently would not be affected and made sorry for their uncomely natural defection. But now bring them out of their cells and holes of darkness, where they have been shut up by themselves, and let them take a view of the splendor and perfections of beauty that are in others, and then, if at all, they will be sorry and dejected at the view of their own defects. This is the case. Men by sin are marred, spoiled, corrupted, depraved, but they may dwell by themselves in the dark. They see neither God, nor angels, nor saints in their excellent nature and beauty, and therefore they are apt to count their own uncomely parts, their ornaments, and their glory. But now, let such as I said see God, see saints, or the ornaments of the Holy Ghost, and themselves as they are without them, and then they cannot but must be affected with and be sorry for their own deformity. When the Lord Christ put forth but little of his excellency before his servant Peter's face, it raised up the depravity of Peter's nature before him to his great confusion and shame, and made him cry out to him, in the midst of all his fellows, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 5, 4 through 8. This, therefore, is the cause of a broken heart, even a sight of divine excellencies and a sense that I am a poor, depraved, spoiled, defiled wretch. And this sight, having broken the heart, begets sorrow in the brokenhearted. To the brokenhearted is a sorrowful man, for that he finds his depravity of nature strong in him, to the putting forth itself to oppose and overthrow what his changed mind doth prompt him to. When I would do good, saith Paul, evil is present with me, Romans 7, 21. Evil is present to oppose, to resist, and make head against the desires of my soul. 
The man that has his bones broken may have yet a mind to be industriously occupied in a lawful and honest calling. But he finds by experience that an infirmity attends his present condition that strongly resists his good endeavors. And at this, he shakes his head, makes complaints, and with sorrow of heart, he sighs and says, I cannot do the thing that I would. Romans 7, 15, Galatians 5, 17. I am weak. I am feeble. I am not only depraved, but by that depravity, deprived of ability to put good motions, good intentions, and desires into execution to completeness. Oh, says he, I am ready to halt. My sorrow is continually before me. Footnote below. The Christian, if he thinks of possessing good motions, joins with such thought his inability to carry them into effect. When I would do good, evil is present with me. How different is this to the self-righteous ignorance so vividly pictured in the Pilgrim's Progress. Ignorance. I am always full of good motions that come into my mind to comfort me as I walk. Christian. What good motions, pray tell us? Ignorance. Why I think of God and heaven. Christian. So do the devils and damned souls. The whole of that deeply interesting dialogue illustrates the difficulty of self-knowledge which can only be acquired by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. See volume 3, page 156, editor George Offer. You must know that the broken-hearted loves God, loves his soul, loves good and hates evil. Now for such an one to find in himself an opposition and continual contradiction to this holy passion, it must needs cost sorrow, godly sorrow, as the Apostle Paul calls it, for such are made sorrow after a godly sort. To be sorry, for that thy nature is with sin depraved, and that through this depravity thou art deprived of ability to do what the word and thy holy mind doth prompt thee to, is to be sorry after a godly sort. For this sorrow worketh that in thee of which thou wilt never have cause to repent, no, not to eternity. Second Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. 3. The broken-hearted man is sorry for those breaches that, by reason of the depravity of his nature, are made in his life and conversation. And this was the case of the man in our text. The vileness of his nature had broken out to the defiling of his life and to the making of him at this time base in conversation. This, this was it that all to break his heart. Footnote, all to break, an obsolete mode of expression for altogether broke. George Offer, editor. He saw in this he had dishonored God, and that cut him. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. Psalms 51.4 He saw in this he had caused the enemies of God to open their mouths and blaspheme, and this cut him to the heart. This made him cry, I have sinned against thee, Lord. This made him say, 
I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Psalms 38, 18. When a man is designed to do a matter, when his heart is set upon it, and the brokenhearted doth design to glorify God, and obstruction to that design, the spoiling of this work makes him sorrowful. Hannah coveted children, but could not have them, and this made her a woman of sorrowful spirit, First Samuel 1.15. A broken-hearted man would be well inwardly, and do that which is well outwardly. But he feels, he finds, he sees he is prevented, prevented at least in part. This makes him sorrowful. In this he groans, groans earnestly, being burdened with his imperfections. Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 3. You know one with broken bones has imperfections, many, and is more sensible of them too, as was said afore, than any other man. And this makes him sorrowful. Yea, and makes him conclude that he shall go softly all his days in the bitterness of his soul. Isaiah 38, 15. Third, the man with a broken heart is a very humble man, or true humility is a sign of a broken heart. Hence, brokenness of heart, contrition of spirit, and humbleness of mind are put together to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Isaiah 57, 15. To follow our similitude, suppose a man, while in bodily health, stout and strong, and one that fears and cares for no man, yet let this man have but a leg or an arm broken, and his courage is quelled. He is now so far off from hectoring of it with a man that he is afraid of every little child that doth but offer to touch him. Now he will court the most feeble that has ought to do with him, to use him and handle him gently. Now he has become a child in courage, a child in fear, and humbleth himself as a little child. Why thus it is with that man that is of a broken and contrite spirit. Time was indeed he could hector, even hector it with God himself, saying, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? Or what profit shall I have if I keep his commandments? Job 21:15. Malachi 3, 13 and 14, A, but now his heart is broken. God has wrestled with him and given him a fall to the breaking of his bones, his heart, and now he crouches, now he cringes, now he begs of God that he will not only do him good, but do it with tender hands. Have mercy upon me, O God, said David, yea, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Psalms 51 and 1. He stands as he sees, not only in need of mercy, but of the tenderest mercies. God has several sorts of mercies, some more rough, some more tender. God can save a man and yet have him a dreadful way to heaven. This the broken-hearted sees, and this the broken-hearted dreads, and therefore pleads for the tenderest sort of mercies. And here we read of his gentle dealing, and that he is very pitiful, and that he deals tenderly with his. But the reason of such expressions no man knows 
But he that is brokenhearted, he has his sores, his running sores, his stinking sores. Wherefore he is pained, and therefore covets to be handled tenderly. Thus God has broken the pride of his spirit, and humbled the loftiness of man, and his humility yet appears. One, in his thankfulness for natural life, he reckoneth at night when he goeth to bed, that like as a lion, so God will tear him to pieces before the morning light. Isaiah 38, 13. There is no judgment that has fallen upon others, but he counts of right he should be swallowed up by it. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. Psalms 119, 120. But perceiving a day added to his life, and that he in the morning is still on this side hell, he cannot choose but take notice of it and acknowledge it as a special favor, saying, God be thanked for holding my soul in life till now and for keeping my life back from the destroyer. Job 33:22. And Psalm 56, verse 13. Man before his heart is broken, counts time his own, and therefore he spends it lavishly upon every idle thing. His soul is far from fear, because the rod of God is not upon him, but when he sees himself under the wounding hand of God, or... When God, like a lion, is breaking all his bones, then he humbleth himself before him, and falleth at his foot. Now he has learned to count every moment a mercy, and every small morsel a mercy. Two, now also the least hopes of mercy for his soul, oh, how precious is it. He that was wont to make orts of the gospel, and that valued promises but as stubble, and the words of God but as rotten wood, now, with what an eye, doth he look on the promise. Footnote. Orts. An obsolete word in England, derived from the Anglo-Saxon. Any worthless leaving or refuse. It is thus used by Shakespeare in his Troilus and Cressida, Acts 5, Scene 2. The fractions of her faith, orts of her love, the fragments, scraps, the bits and greasy relics of her or eaten faith. Editor George Offer. Yea, he counted a peradventure of mercy more rich, more worth than the whole world. Now, as we say, he is glad to leap at a crust. Now, to be a dog in God's house is counted better by him than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Matthew 15, verse 16 and 27. Luke 15, verse 17 through 19. 3. Now he that was wont to look scornfully upon the people of God, yea, that used to scorn, to show them a gentle cast of his countenance, now he admires and bows before them and is ready to lick the dust of their feet, and would count it his greatest, the highest honor, to be as one of the least of them. Make me as one of thy hired servants, says he, Luke fifteen nineteen. For now he is in his own eyes the greatest fool in nature, for that he sees he has been so mistaken in his ways, 
and has not yet but little, if any, true knowledge of God. Everyone now, says he, have more knowledge of God than I. Everyone serves him better than I. Psalm 73, 21, 22, Proverbs 32, 3. 5. Now may he be but one, though the least, in the kingdom of heaven. Now may he be but one, though the least, in the church on earth. Now may he be but loved, though the least beloved of saints. How high an account doth he set thereon. 6. Now when he talketh with God or men, how doth he debase himself before them? If with God, how does he accuse himself and load himself with the acknowledgments of his own villainies, which he committed in the days wherein he was the enemy of God? Lord, said Paul, that contrite one, I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Acts 22, 19, 20. Yea, I punished thy saints oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Acts 26, 9 through 11. Also, when he comes to speak to saints, how doth he make himself vile before them? I am, saith he, the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle. I am less than the least of all saints. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor and injurious, and so forth. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Ephesians 3, 8, 1 Timothy 1, 13. What humility, what self-abasing thoughts doth a broken heart produce? When David danced before the ark of God, also how did he discover his nakedness to the disliking of his wife? And when she taunted him for his doing, says he, it was before the Lord, and so forth. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight. Second Samuel six twenty through 22 Oh, the man that is, or that has been kindly broken in his spirit, and that is of a contrite heart, is a lowly, humble man. For the broken-hearted man is a man that sees himself in spirituals to be poor. Therefore, as humble and contrite, so poor and contrite are put together in the word. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. Isaiah 66, 1, 2. And here we still pursue our metaphor. A wounded man, a man with broken bones, concludes his condition to be but poor, very poor. Ask him how he does, and he answers, truly, neighbor, in a very poor condition. Also, you have the spiritual poverty of such as have or have had their hearts broken, and that have been of contrite spirits, much made mention of in the word and they go by two names to distinguish them from others. They are called thy poor, that is, God's poor. They are also called the poor in spirit. Psalms 72.2, 74.19, Matthew 5.3. Now the man that is poor in his own eyes, for of him we now discourse, and the brokenhearted is such an one, is sensible of his wants. He knows he cannot help himself, and therefore is forced 
to be content to live by the charity of others. Thus it is in nature, thus it is in grace. One, the brokenhearted, now knows his want, and he knew it not till now. As he that has a broken bone knew no want of a bone setter till he knew his bone was broken. His broken bone makes him know it. His pain and anguish makes him know it. And, and thus it is in spirituals. Now he sees to be poor indeed is to want the sense of the favor of God. For his great pain is a sense of wrath, as hath been shown before. And the voice of joy would heal his broken bones. Psalms 51, 8. Two things he thinks would make him rich. One, a right and title to Jesus Christ and all his benefits. Two, and saving faith therein. They that are spiritually rich are rich in him and in the faith of him. Second Corinthians 8, 9, James 2 and 5. The first of these giveth us a right to the kingdom of heaven. And the second yields the soul the comfort of it. And the brokenhearted man wants the sense and knowledge of his interest in these. That he knows he wants them is plain. But that he knows he has them is what as yet he wants the attainment of. Hence he says, the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst. Isaiah 41, 17. There is none in their view none in their view for them. Hence David, when he had his broken heart, felt he wanted washing. He wanted purging. He wanted to be made white. He knew that spiritual riches lay there, but he did not so well perceive that God had washed and purged him. Yea, he rather was afraid that all was going that he was in danger of being cast out of God's presence, and that the Spirit of grace would be utterly taken from him. Psalms 51. That is the first thing. The brokenhearted is poor because he knows his wants. Two, the brokenhearted is poor because he knows he cannot help himself to what he knows he wants. The man that has a broken arm, as he knows it, so he knows of himself, he cannot set it. This, therefore, is the second thing that declares a man is poor. Otherwise, he is not so. For suppose a man wants never so much, yet if he can but help himself, if he can furnish himself, if he can supply his own wants out of what he has, he cannot be a poor man. Yea, the more he wants, the greater are his riches if he can supply his own wants out of his own purse. He then is the poor man that knows his spiritual want and also knows he cannot supply or help himself. But this the broken-hearted man knows. Therefore, he in his own eyes is the only poor man. True, he may have something of his own, but that will not supply his want. And therefore, he is a poor man still. I have sacrifices, says David, but thou dost not desire them. Therefore, my poverty remains, Psalms 51, 16. Lead is not gold. Lead is not current money with the merchants. There is none has spiritual gold to sell but Christ. 
Revelation 3.18. What can a man do to procure Christ or procure faith or love? Yea, had he never so much of his own carnal excellencies, no, not one penny of it will go for pay in that market where grace is to be had. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. Songs 8, 7. This the broken-hearted man perceives and therefore he sees himself to be spiritually poor. True, he has a broken heart, and that is of great esteem with God, but that is not of nature's goodness. That is a gift, a work of God, and that is the sacrifices of God. Besides, a man cannot remain content and at rest with that. For that, in the nature of it, does but show him he is poor, and that his wants are such as himself cannot supply. Besides, there is but little ease in a broken heart. 3. The broken-hearted man is poor and sees it, because he finds he is now disabled to live any way else but by begging. This David betook himself to, though he was a king, for he knew as to his soul's health he could live no way else. This poor man cried, saith he, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Psalms 34 and 6. And this leads me to the fifth sign. Fifth. Another sign of a broken heart is a crying, a crying out. Pain, you know, will make one cry. Go to them that have upon them the anguish of broken bones, and see if they do not cry. Anguish makes them cry. This, this is that which quickly follows. If once thy heart be broken, and thy spirit indeed made contrite, One, I say, anguish will make thee cry. Trouble and anguish, saith David, have taken hold on me. Psalms 119, 143. Anguish, you know, doth naturally provoke to cry. Now as a broken bone has anguish, a broken heart has anguish. Hence the pains of one that has a broken heart, are compared to the pangs of a woman in travail. John 16, 20 through 22. Anguish will make one cry alone, cry to oneself, and this is called a bemoaning of oneself. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself, saith God. Jeremiah 31, 18. That is, being at present under the breaking, chastising hand of God. Thou hast chastised me, saith he, and I was chastised as a bullock, unaccustomed to the oak. This is his meaning also who said, I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. And why? Why, my heart is sore pain within me. Psalms 55, verse 2 through 4. This is a self-bemoaning, a bemoaning themselves in secret and retired places. You know it is common with them who are distressed with anguish, though all alone, to cry out to themselves, of their present pain, saying, Oh, my leg, oh, my arm, oh, my bowels, or as the son of the Shunammite, my head, my head, Second Kings 4.19, Oh, the groans, the sighs, the cries that the brokenhearted have 
when by themselves are alone. Oh, say they, my sins, my sins, my soul, my soul. How am I loaded with guilt? How am I surrounded with fear? Oh, this hard, this desperate, this unbelieving heart. Oh, how sin defileth my will, my mind, my conscience. I am afflicted and ready to die. Psalms 88, 15. Footnote. This is in exact agreement with the author's experience, which he had published 22 years before under the title of Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. I was more loathsome in my own eyes than was a toad, and I thought I was so in God's eyes too. Sin and corruption, I said, would as naturally bubble out of my heart as water would out of a fountain. I thought that none but the devil himself could equal me for inward wickedness and pollution of mind, a sure sign that God, as his heavenly Father, was enlightening his memory by the Holy Spirit. Volume 1, page 16, number 84, editor George Offer. Could some of you carnal people but get behind the chamber door to hear Ephraim when he is at the work of self-bemoaning, it would make you stand amazed to hear him bewail that sin in himself in which you take delight, and to hear him bemoan his misspending of time while you spend all in pursuing your filthy lusts, and to hear him offended with his heart because it will not better comply with God's holy will, while you are afraid of his word and ways, and never think yourselves better than when farthest off from God. The unruliness of the passions and lusts of the broken-hearted make them often get into a corner and thus bemoan themselves. Two, as they thus cry out in a bemoaning manner of and to themselves, so they have their outcries of and against themselves to others. As she said in another case, Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. Lamentations 1.12 All the bitter cries and complaints that the broken-hearted have and make to one another, still every one imagining that his own wounds are deepest and his own sores fullest of anguish and hardest to be cured. Say they, if our iniquities be upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Ezekiel 33 and 10. Once being at an honest woman's house, I, after some pause, asked her how she did. She said very badly. I asked her if she was sick. She answered, no. What then, said I? Are any of your children ill? She told me no. What, said as I? Is your husband amiss? Or do you go back in the world? No, no, said she, but I am afraid I shall not be saved. And broke out with heavy heart, saying, Oh, good man, Bunyan, Christ, and a pitcher. If I had Christ, though I went and begged my bread with a pitcher, it would be better with me than I think it is now. This woman had her heart broken. This woman wanted Christ. This woman was concerned for her soul. There are but few women, rich women, that count Christ and a picture better than the world, their pride and pleasures. This woman cries 
are worthy to be recorded. It was a cry that carried in it not only a sense of the want, but also of the worth of Christ. This cry, Christ and a pitcher, made a melodious noise in the ears of the very angels. Footnote. This account of the author's interview with a pious, humble woman is an agreeable episode which relieves the mind without diverting it from the serious object of the treaties. It was probably an event which took place in one of those pastoral visits which Bunyan was in the habit of making and which, if wisely made, so endears a minister to the people of his charge. Christ and a crust is the common saying to express the sentiment that Christ is all in all. The picture has reference to the custom of pilgrims in carrying at their girdle a vessel to hold water. The staff having a crook by which it was dipped up from the well or river. Editor George Hopper. But I say, few women cry out thus. Few women are so in love with their own eternal salvation as to be willing to part with all their lusts and vanities for Jesus Christ and a picture. Good Jacob also was thus. If the Lord, said he, will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, then he shall be my God. Yea, he vowed it should be so. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Genesis 28, verse 20. Three, as they bemoan themselves and make their complaints to one and another, so they cry to God. O oh God, said Heman, I have cried day and night before thee. But when? Why, when his soul was full of trouble, and his life drew near to the grave. Psalms 88, 1 through 3. Or, as it says in another place, out of the deep, out of the belly of hell cried I. Psalms 130, verse 1. Jonah 2 and 2. By such words expressing what painful condition they were in when they cried. See how God himself words it. My pleasant portion, says he, is become a desolate wilderness, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. Jeremiah 12:11. And this also is natural to those whose hearts are broken. Whether goes the child, when it catcheth harm, but to its father, to its mother, where doth it lay its head, but in their lap, into whose bosom doth it pour out its complaint, more especially, but into the bosom of the father, of a mother, because there are bowels, there is pity, there is relief and succor, and thus it is with them whose bones, whose hearts are broken. It is natural to them. They must cry. They cannot but cry to him. Lord, heal me, said David, for my bones are vexed. Lord, heal me, for my soul is also sore vexed. Psalm 6, verses 1 through 3. He that cannot cry feels no pain, sees no want, fears no danger, or else is 
dead. Sixth, another sign of a broken heart and of a contrite spirit is, it trembleth at God's word. To him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Isaiah 66, 2. The word of God is an awful word to a broken-hearted man. Solomon says, The word of a king is as the roaring of a lion. And if so, what is the word of God? For by the wrath and fear is meant the authoritative word of a king. We have a proverb, The burnt child dreads the fire, the whipped child fears the rod, even so the broken-hearted fears the word of God. Hence, you have a remark set upon them that tremble at God's word, to wit, they are they that keep among the godly. They are they that keep within compass. They are they that are aptest to mourn and to stand in the gap when God is angry and to turn away his wrath from a people. It is a sign the word of God has had place and wrought powerfully. When the heart trembleth at it, is afraid and stands in awe of it. When Joseph's mistress tempted him to lie with her, he was afraid of the word of God. How then can I do this great wickedness, said he, and sin against God? He stood in awe of God's word, durst not do it, because he kept in remembrance what a dreadful thing it was to rebel against God's word. When old Eli heard that the ark was taken, his very heart trembled within him. For he read by that sad loss that God was angry with Israel, and he knew the anger of God was a great and terrible thing. When Samuel went to Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled, for they feared that he came to them with some sad message from God, and they had had experience of the dread of such things before. Genesis 39, 7 through 9, 1 Samuel 4, 13, 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 4. When Ezra would have a mourning in Israel for the sins of the land, he sent and there came to him every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. Ezra 9, Four. There are, I say, a sort of people that tremble at the words of God and that are afraid of doing aught that is contrary to them. But they are only such with whose souls and spirits the word has had to do. For the rest, they are resolved to go on their course. Let God say what he will. As for the word of the Lord, said rebellious Israel to Jeremiah, that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. Jeremiah 44, 16. But do you think that these people did ever feel the power and majesty of the word of God to break their hearts? No, verily, had that been so, they would have trembled at the words of God. They would have been afraid of the words of God. God may command some people what he will. They will do what they list. What care they for God? What care they for his word? Neither threats nor promises, neither punishments or favors will make them obedient to the word of God, and all because they have not felt the power of it. Their hearts have not been broken with it. When King Josias 
did but read in God's book what punishment God had threatened against rebellious Israel. Though he himself was a holy and good man, he humbled himself, he rent his clothes, and wept before the Lord and was afraid of the judgment threatened. Second Kings 22, Second Chronicles 34. For he knew what a dreadful thing the word of God is. Some men, as I said before, dare do anything. Let the word of God be never so much against it. But they that tremble at the word dare not do so. No, they must make the word their rule for all they do. They must go to the Holy Bible and there inquire what may or may not be done. For they tremble at the word. This then is another sign, a true sign, that the heart has been broken, namely, when the heart is made afraid of and trembleth at the word. Acts 9, 4 through 6, Acts 16, 29, 30. Trembling at the word is caused by a belief of what is deserved, threatened, and of what will come if not prevented by repentance, and therefore the heart melts and breaks before the Lord. For the necessity there is that the heart must be broken. I come in the next place to speak to this question. But what necessity is there that the heart must be broken? Cannot a man be saved unless his heart be broken? I answer, avoiding secret things which only belong to God, there is a necessity of breaking the heart in, in order to salvation, because a man will not sincerely comply with the means conducing thereunto until his heart is broken. For, first, Man taken as he comes into the world, as to spirituals, as to evangelical things in which mainly lies man's eternal felicity, and there he is as one dead and so stupefied and holy in himself as unconcerned with it. Footnote. The word holy here is spelt W-H. O-L-L-Y. Now back to the reading of Bunyan. Nor can any call or admonition that has not a heart-breaking power attending of it bring him to a due consideration of his present state, and so unto an effectual desire to be saved. Many ways... God has manifested this. He has threatened men with temporal judgments. Yea, sent such judgments upon them once and again, over and over. But they will not do. What? says he. I have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. I have withholden the rain from you. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. I have sent among you the pestilence. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Amos 4, 6 through 11. See here. Here is judgment upon judgment. Stroke after stroke. Punishment after punishment. But all will not do unless the heart is broken. Yea, another prophet seems to say that such things, instead of converting the soul, sets it further off. If heart-breaking work attends such strokes, why should ye be stricken any more, says he? Ye will revolt more and more. Isaiah 1 and 5. Man's heart is fenced. It is grown gross. There is a skin that, 
like a coat of mail, has wrapped it up and enclosed it in on every side. This skin, this coat of mail, unless it be cut off and taken away, the heart remains untouched, whole, and so as unconcerned. Whatever judgment or affliction is light upon the body, Matthew 13, 15, Acts 28, 27, this which I call the coat of mail, the fence of the heart, has two great names in Scripture. It is called the foreskin of the heart and the armor in which the devil trusteth. Deuteronomy 10.16, Luke 11.22 Because these shield and fence the heart from all gospel doctrine and from all legal punishments, nothing can come at it till these are removed. The heart is said to be circumcised, that is, this foreskin is taken away, and this coat of mail is spoiled. I will circumcise thy heart, saith he, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and then the devil's goods are spoiled, that thou mayest live. Deuteronomy 36, Luke 11, 22. And now... The heart lies open. Now the word will prick, cut, and pierce it. And it being cut, pricked, and pierced, it bleeds, it faints, it falls and dies at the foot of God unless it is supported by the grace and love of God in Jesus Christ. Conversion, you know, begins at the heart. But if the heart be so secured by sin and Satan, as I have said, all judgments are, while that is so, in vain. Hence Moses, after he had made a long relation of mercy and judgment unto the children of Israel, suggests that yet the great thing was wanting to them, and that thing was and heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto that day. Deuteronomy 29, 2 and 3. Their hearts were as yet not touched to the quick, were not awakened and wounded by the holy word of God, and made tremble at its truth and terror. But I say, before the heart be touched, pricked, made smart, and so forth, how can it be thought, be the danger never so great, that it should repent, cry, bow, and break at the foot of God, and supplicate there for mercy? And yet thus it must do, for thus God has ordained, and thus God has appointed it, nor can men be saved without it. But I say... Can a man spiritually dead, a stupid man whose heart is past feeling, do this before he has his dead and stupid heart awakened to see and feel its state and misery without it? But, second, man take him as he comes into the world, and how wise soever he is in worldly and temporal things, he is yet a fool as to that which is spiritual and heavenly. Hence Paul says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, because he is indeed a fool to them. Neither, says the text, can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But how now must this fool be made wise? Why, wisdom must be put into his heart. Job 38, verse 36 now none can put it there but God. And how doth he put it there? But by making room there for it. 
by taking away the thing which hinders, which is that folly and madness which naturally dwelleth there. But how doth he take that away but by severe chastising of his soul for it, until he has made him weary of it? The whip and stripes are provided for the natural fool, and so it is for him that is spiritually so. Proverbs 19, verse 29. Solomon intimates that it is a hard thing to make a fool become wise. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Proverbs 27, verse 22. By this it appears that it is a hard thing to make a fool a wise man. To bray one in a mortar is a dreadful thing. To bray one there with a pestle, and yet it seems a whip, a mortar, and a pestle is the way. And if this is the way to make one wise in this world, and if all this will hardly do, how must the fool that is so in spirituals be whipped and beaten and stripped before he is made wise therein? Yea, his heart must be put into God's mortar, and must be beaten. Yea, braid there with the pestle of the law, before it loves to hearken unto heavenly things. It is a great word in Jeremiah, through deceit, that is, folly. They refuse to know me, saith the Lord, and what follows? Why, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them, that is, with fire. For how shall I do for the daughter of my people, Jeremiah 9, 6, and 7? I will melt them. I will put them into my furnace, and there I will try them, and there I will make them know me, saith the Lord. When David was under spiritual chastisement for his sin, and had his heart under the breaking hand of God, then he said, God should make him know wisdom. Psalms 51, 6. Now he was in the mortar. Now he was in the furnace. Now he was bruised and melted. Yea, now his bone, his heart was breaking, and now his folly was departing. Now, says he, thou shalt make me to know wisdom, if I know anything of the way of God with us fools, there is nothing else will make us wise men, yea, a thousand breakings will not make us so wise as we should be. We say, wisdom is not good, till it is bought, and he that buys it, according to the intention of that proverb, usually smarts for it. The fool is wise in his own conceit. Wherefore, there is a double difficulty attends him before he can be wise indeed. Not only his folly, but his wisdom must be removed from him. And how shall that be but by ripping up of his heart by some sore conviction that may show him plainly that his wisdom is his folly? and that which will undo him. A fool loves his folly, that is, as treasure. So much is he in love with it. Now then, it must be a great thing that must make a fool forsake his folly. The foolish will not weigh nor consider, nor compare wisdom with their folly. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Proverbs 15, 21, Proverbs 26 and 11. So low are they when driven from it to let it go, to let it depart from them. Wherefore, there must go a great deal to the making of a man a Christian. For as to that, Every man is a fool, yea, the greatest fool. 
the most unconcerned fool, the most self-willed fool of all fools, yea, one that will not be turned from his folly, but by the breaking of his heart. David was one of these fools. Manasseh was one of these fools. Saul, otherwise called Paul, was one of these fools. And so was I. And that, the biggest of all. Footnote. However hard and even harsh these terms may appear, they are fully justified. And with all the author's great ability and renown, he has the grace of humility to acknowledge that by nature and practice he had been the biggest of fools. Editor George Offer. Third, man, take him as he comes into the world, and he is not only a dead man and a fool, but a proud man also. Pride is one of those sins that first showeth itself to children, yea, and it grows up with them and mixeth itself with all they do. But it lies most hid, most deep in man as to his soul concern. For the nature of sin as sin is not only to be vile, but to hide its vileness from the soul. Hence many think they do well when they sin. Jonah thought he did well to be angry with God, Jonah 4 and 9. The Pharisees thought they did well when they said Christ had a devil, John 8, 48. And Paul thought verily that he ought to do many things against or contrary to the name of Jesus, which he also did with great madness, Acts 26, 9, 10. And thus sin puffs up men with pride and a conceit of themselves that they are a thousand times better than they are. Hence they think they are the children of God when they are the children of the devil, and that they are something as to Christianity when they neither are such nor know what it is that they must have to make them such. John eight forty one through forty four, Galatians six three. Now whence flows this but from pride and a self conceit of themselves? and that their state is good for another world, when they are yet in their sins and under the curse of God. Yea, and this pride is so strong and high, and yet so hid in them, that all the ministers in the world cannot persuade them that this is pride, not grace, in which they are so confident. Hence they slight all reproof rebukes, threatenings, or admonitions that are pressed upon them to prevail with them to take heed that they be not herein deceived. Hear ye, saith the prophet, and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord hath spoken. But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. Jeremiah 13, 15 through 17. And what was the conclusion? Why all the proud men stood out still and maintained their resistance of God and his holy prophet, Jeremiah 43 and 2. Nor is there anything that will prevail with these to the saving of their souls until their hearts are broken. David, after he had defiled Bathsheba and slain her husband, yet boasted himself in his justice and holiness and would by all means have the man put to death 
that had but taken the poor man's lamb, when alas, poor soul himself was the great transgressor. But would he believe it? No, no, he stood upon the vindicating of himself to be a just doer, nor would he be made to fall until Nathan, by authority from God, did tell him that he was the man whom himself had condemned. Thou art the man, said he, at which word his conscience was awakened, his heart wounded, and so his soul made to fall under the burden of his guilt at the feet of the God of heaven for mercy. Second Samuel 12, 1 through 13. Ah, pride, pride, thou art that which holds many a man in the chains of his sins. Thou art it, thou cursed self-conceit, and keepest them from believing that their state is damnable. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God, Psalms 10.4, and if there is so much in the pride of his countenance, what is there, think you, in the pride of his heart? Therefore, Job says, it is to hide pride from man, and so to save his soul from hell, that God chasteneth him with pain upon his bed, until the multitude of his bones stick out, and until his life draws nigh to the destroyer. Job 33, 17, 22. It is a hard thing to take man off his pride, and make him, instead of trusting in and boasting of his goodness, wisdom, honesty, and the like, to see himself a sinner, a fool, yea, a man that is cruel as to his own immortal soul. Pride of heart has a power in it, and is therefore compared to an iron sinew and an iron chain by which they are made stout, and with which they are held in that stoutness to oppose the Lord and drive his word from their hearts. Leviticus 26.19, Psalm 73 and 6. This was a sin of devils, and it is the sin of man, and the sin, I say, from which no man can be delivered until his heart is broken, and then his pride is spoiled. Then he will be glad to yield. If a man be proud of his strength or manhood, a broken leg will maul him. And if a man be proud of his goodness, a broken heart will maul him. Because, as has been said, a broken heart comes by the discovery and charge of sin by the power of God upon the conscience. Fourth, man take him as he comes into the world, and he is not only a dead man, a fool, and proud, but also self-willed and headstrong. Second Peter 2.10 A stubborn, ungained creature is man before his heart is broken. Hence they are so often called rebels rebellious, and disobedient. They will only do what they list. All day long, says God, have I stretched out my hand to a disobedient and gainsaying people. And hence again, they are compared to a self-willed or headstrong horse that will, in spite of his rider, rush into the battle. Everyone, says God, turneth to his course, as a horse rusheth into battle. Jeremiah 8, verse 6. They say with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Psalms 12, verse 4. Hence they are said to stop their ears, to pull away their shoulder, to shut their eyes and harden their hearts against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. 
Psalms 107, verse 11. Zechariah 7, verse 10, 12. They are fitly compared to the rebellious son who would not be ruled by his parents, or to the prodigal who would have all in his own hand and remove himself far away from father and father's house. Deuteronomy 21, 20, Luke 15, 13. Now for such creatures, nothing will do but violence. The stubborn son must be stoned till he dies, and the prodigal must be famished out of all. Nothing else, I say, will do. Their self-willed stubborn heart will not comply with the will of God before it is broken. Deuteronomy 21:21, 21, 21, Luke 15:14 through 17. These are they that are called the stout-hearted. These are said to be far from righteousness, and so will remain until their hearts are broken. For so they must be made to know themselves. Isaiah 9, 9 through 11. Fifth, man as he comes into the world is not only a dead man, a fool, proud, and self-willed, but also a fearless creature. There is, saith the text, no fear of God before their eyes. Romans 3.18 No fear of God. There is fear of man. Fear of losing his favor, his love, his goodwill, his help, his friendship. This is seen everywhere. How do the poor fear the rich? The weak fear the strong, and those that are threatened, them that threaten. But come now to God, why none fear him? That is, by nature, none reverence him. They neither fear his frown, nor seek his favor, nor inquire how they may escape his revenging hand that is lifted up against their sins and their souls because of sin. Little things they fear, the losing of them, but the soul they are not afraid to lose. They fear not me, saith the Lord, Malachi 3 and 5. How many times are some men put in mind of death by sickness upon themselves, by graves, by the death of others? How many times? Are they put in mind of hell by reading the word, by lashes of conscience, and by some that go roaring in despair out of this world? How many times are they put in mind of the day of judgment as one by God binding the fallen angels over to judgment, who by the drowning of the old world, Second Peter 2, 4, 5, Jude 6 and 7. 3. By the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire from heaven. Second Peter 2, 6, Jude 7. 4. By appointing a day. Acts 17, 29 through 31. 5. By appointing a judge. Acts 10, 40 through 42. 6 by reserving their crimes in records, Isaiah 30 and 8, Revelation 20, 12. 7. By appointing and preparing of witnesses, Romans 2, 15. 8. And by promising, yea, threatening, yea, resolving to call the whole world to his bar there to be judged for all which they have done and said, and for every secret thing, Matthew 25, 31 through 33, Matthew 12, 36, Ecclesiastes 11, 9, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. And yet they fear not God. Alas, they believe not these things. These things to carnal men are like Lot preaching to his sons and daughters that were in Sodom. When he told them 
that God would destroy that place, he seemed unto them as one that mocked. And his words to them were as idle tales. Genesis 19.14 Fearless men are not won by words. Blows, wounds, and killings are the things that must bring them under fear. How many struggling fits had Israel with God in the wilderness? How many times did they declare that there they feared him not? And observe, they were seldom of ever brought to fear and dread his glorious name unless he beset them round with death and the grave. Nothing, nothing but a severe hand will make the fearless fear. Hence, to speak after the manner of men, God is put upon it to go this way with sinners when he would save their souls, even bring them and lay them at the mouth and within sight of hell and everlasting damnation, and there also charge them with sin and guilt to the breaking of their hearts before they will fear his name. Six. Man, as he comes into the world, is not only a dead man, a fool, proud, self-willed, and fearless, but he is a false believer concerning God. Let God report of himself never so plainly. Man by nature will not believe this report of him. No, they are become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart is darkened. Wherefore they turn the glory of God, which is his truth, into a lie. Romans 1, 21 through 25. God says, he sees. They say, he seeth not. God saith, he knows. They say, he doth not know. God saith, none is like himself. Yet they say, he is altogether alike to them. God saith, None shall keep his door for naught. They say it is in vain and to no profit to serve him. He saith he will do good. They say he will neither do good nor evil. Job twenty-two thirteen fourteen Psalms fifty twenty-one Job twenty-one fourteen through fifteen Malachi three fourteen. Zephaniah 1.12, Thus they falsely believe concerning God, yea, as to the word of his grace and the revelation of his mercy in Christ, they stick not to say by their practice, for a wicked man speaketh with his feet. Proverbs 6.13, That, that is a stark lie and not to be trusted to. 1 John 5 and 10. Now, what shall God do to save these men? If he hides himself and conceals his glory, they perish. If he sends to them by his messengers and forebears to come to them himself, they perish. If he comes to them and forebears to work upon them by his word, they perish. If he worketh on them, but not effectually they perish. If he works effectually, he must break their hearts and make them as men wounded to death, fall at his feet for mercy, or there can be no good done on them. They will not rightly believe until he fires them out of their misbelief and makes them to know by the breaking of their bones for their false faith that he is and will be what he has said of himself in his holy word. Footnote. Man must be burnt out of the stronghold in which he trusted, saved yet so as by fire, baptized with the Holy Ghost even fire. His word is as a fire. Reader, the work of regeneration and purification is a trying work. May each inquire, has this fire burnt up my wood, hay, and stubble? Editor George Offer.
The heart, therefore, must be broken before the man can come to good. Seventh, man as he comes into the world is not only a dead man, a fool, proud, self-willed, fearless, and a false believer, but a great lover of sin. He is captivated, ravished, drowned in the delights of it. Hence it, the word, says they love sin, delight in lies, do take pleasure in iniquity, and in them that do it, that they sport themselves in their own deceivings and glory in their shame. John 3.19 Psalms 62 and 4, Romans 1, 32, 2 Peter 2, 13, Philippians 3, 19. This is the temper of man by nature, for sin is mixed with and has the mastery of all the powers of his soul. Hence they are said to be captive to it and to be led captive into the pleasures of it at the will of the devil, Second Timothy 2.26. And you know it is not an easy thing to break love or to take the affections off that object on which they are so deeply set, in which they are so deeply rooted as man's heart is in his sins. Alas, how many are there that contemn all the allurements of heaven and the, that trample upon all the threatenings of God and that say touch at all the flames of hell whenever these are propounded as motives to work them off their sinful delight. So fixed are they, so mad are they upon these beastly idols, yea, he that shall take in hand to stop their course in this their way is as he that shall attempt to prevent the raging waves of the sea from their course when driven by the mighty wind. When men are somewhat put to it, when reason and conscience shall begin a little to hearken to a preacher or a judgment that shall begin to hunt for iniquity, how many tricks, evasions, excuses, demurs, delays, and hiding holes will they make, invent, and find to hide and preserve their sweet sins with themselves and their souls in the lights of them, to their own eternal perdition. Hence, they endeavor to stifle conscience, to choke convictions, to forget God, to make themselves atheists, to contradict preachers that are plain and honest, and to heap to themselves such of them only as are like themselves that speak unto them smooth things and prophesy deceits. Yea, they say themselves to such preachers, Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Isaiah 38 to 11. If they be followed still, and conscience and guilt shall like bloodhounds find them out in their secret places, and roar against them for their wicked lives, then they will flatter, cog, dissemble, and lie against their souls, promising to mend, to turn, to repent and grow better shortly, and all to daff off convictions and molestations in their wicked ways, that they may yet pursue their lusts, their pleasures, and sinful delights in quiet and without control. Footnote. To daff or doff, to do off or throw aside, used by Shakespeare, but now obsolete. Where is his son, the nimble-footed madcap Prince of Wales, and his comrades that daft the world aside and let it pass? Editor George Offer.
Yea, further, I have known some that have been made to roar like bears, to yell like dragons, and to howl like dogs by reason of the weight of guilt and the lashes of hell upon their conscience for their evil deeds, who have so soon as their present torments and fears were gone returned again with the dog to his vomit, and as the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Hosea 7, verse 14, 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. Once again, some have been made taste of the good word of God, of the joy of heaven, and of the powers of the world to come, and yet could not by any one, nay, by all of these, be made to break their league forever with their lusts and sins. Hebrews 6, 4, 5, Luke 8, 13, John 5, 33 through 35. O Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Wherein is he to be accounted of? He has sinned against thee. He loves his sins more than thee. He is a lover of pleasure more than he is a lover of God. But now... How shall this man be reclaimed from this sin? How shall he be brought, wrought, and made to be out of love with it? Doubtless it can be by no other means, by what we can see in the word, but by the wounding, breaking, and disabling of the heart that loves it. And by that means, making it a plague and gall unto it. Sin may be made an affliction, and as gall and wormwood to them that love it. But the making of it so bitter a thing to such a man will not be done but by great and sore means. I remember we had in our town sometime since a little girl that loved to eat the heads of foul tobacco pipes, and neither rod nor good words could reclaim her and make her leave them. So her father takes advice of a doctor to wean her from them, and it was this. Take, saith he, a great many of the foulest tobacco pipe heads you can get, and boil them in milk, and make a posset of that milk, and make your daughter drink the posset, drink up. He did so, and gave his girl it, and made her drink it up, the which became so irksome and nauseous to her stomach, and made her so sick that she could never abide to meddle with tobacco pipe heads any more, and so was cured of that disease. Thou lovest thy sin, and neither rod nor good word will as yet reclaim thee. Well, take heed. If thou wilt not be reclaimed, God will make thee a posset of them, which shall be so bitter to thy soul, so irksome to thy taste, so loathsome to thy mind, and so afflicting to thy heart, that it shall break it with sickness and grief till it be loathsome to thee. I say thus, he will do if he loves thee. If not, he will suffer thee to take thy course, and will let thee go on with thy tobacco pipe heads. The children of Israel will have flesh, must have flesh. They weep, cry, and murmur, because they have not flesh. The bread of heaven, that is but light and sorry stuff in their esteem. Numbers 11, 1 through 6. Moses goes and tells God how the people despise his heavenly bread, and how they longed, lusted, and desired to be fed with flesh. Well, says God, they shall have flesh. They shall have their fill of flesh. I will feed them with it. They shall have to the full, and that ye shall not eat 
one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because ye have despised the Lord. Numbers 11, 11 through 20. He can tell how to make that loathsome to thee, on which thou most dost set thine evil heart, and he will do so, if he loves thee, else, as I said, he will not make thee sick by smiting of thee, nor punish thee for or when thou committest whoredom, but will let thee alone till the judgment day, and call thee to a reckoning for all thy sins then. But to pass this, eight, man as he comes into the world is not only a dead man, a fool, proud, self-willed, fearless, a false believer, and a lover of sin, but a wild man. He is of the wild olive tree, of that which is wild by nature. Romans 11, 17, and 24. So in another place, man by nature is compared to the ass, to a wild ass, for vain or empty man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's coat. Job 11:12. Isaac was a figure of Christ and of all converted men. Galatians 4:28. But Ishmael was a figure of man by nature, and the Holy Ghost, as to that, saith this of him, and he will be a wild man. Genesis 16:12. This man, I say, was a figure of all carnal men in their wildness or estrangedness from God. Hence it is said of the prodigal, at his conversion that he came to himself then, implying that he was mad, wild, or out of his wits before. Luke fifteen seventeen. I know there is a difference sometime betwixt one's being wild and mad, yet sometimes wildness arriveth to that degree as to give one rightly the denomination of being mad. And it is always true in spirituals, namely, that he that is wild as to God is mad, or besides himself, and so not capable before he is tamed of minding his own eternal good as he should. There are these several things that are tokens of one wild or mad, and they all meet in a carnal man. One, a wild or madman, gives no heed to good counsel. The frenzy of his head shuts all out, and by its force leads him away from men that are wise and sober. And thus it is with carnal men. Good counsel is to them as pearls are that are cast up or swine. It is trampled under foot of them, and the man is despised that brings it. Matthew 7, 6. The poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Ecclesiastes 9, 16. To a wild or madman, let him alone, and he will greatly busy himself all his life to accomplish that which, when it is completed, amounts to nothing. The work, the toil, the travel of such a one comes to nothing, save to declare that he was out of his wits that did it. David, imitating of such a one, scrabbled upon the gate of the king, as fools do with chalk. And like to this is all the work of all carnal men in the world. 1 Samuel 21, 12, 13. Hence, such a one is said to labor for the wind, 
or for what will amount to no more than if he filled his belly with the east wind. Ecclesiastes 5.16, Job 15.2. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats at www.swrb.com.